just imagine there's been some kind of global catastrophe. A doomsday event, an apocalypse. Maybe it was a viral pandemic, a nuclear war, or an asteroid strike. But whatever the cause, civilization has collapsed and the vast majority of humanity has died. But some survive. Even if 99% of the world's population today were to be wiped out, that would still leave millions of people, roughly the population during the Bronze Age. They could reboot civilization, but only if they knew what they needed to do. Let's imagine you are part of a community of post-apocalyptic survivors, and you're now thinking, what next? What do we most need to know? What's the most useful scientific knowledge and technological inventions that we could use to start rebooting civilization itself? How could we rebuild everything from scratch? I'm Professor Lewis Dartnell. I'm a scientist, and I'm the author of a book called The Knowledge, How to Rebuild Our World from Scratch. During my research, I've been looking at lots of real-world case studies, like the Great Blackout in the city of New York, shipwrecked sailors, or prisoners of war. Great examples of human ingenuity trying to recover and keep things running. Some of this has become quite pertinent now with the current global pandemic of the coronavirus. And this will definitely not be the last global pandemic. And so a lot of people around the world have now been thinking, well, what is going on behind the scenes in this global industrialized economy that just makes things magically appear on the shelves when I need them? What is the invisible infrastructure behind the scenes that provide for our everyday lives. After a collapse of civilization, you're going to want to move out of cities like this. They're wonderfully convenient places to live in our modern world. But once the technological bubble that supports them has burst, a modern urban environment simply isn't a habitable place. You can't survive in a city when there's not water being pumped out of the taps, when there's no gas flowing down the mains, there's no electricity to run the buildings, to run the elevators that get you to the top. And not only that, cities would be positively dangerous places. Once no one is maintaining them, fires will start raging through these densely packed buildings any gas that does remain in the pipes, or reservoirs of chemicals, like in dry cleaning shops, could explode. My advice would be to get out of the city and move into a more rural location. Move into the countryside, where you can support yourself, where you can drink the water flowing down fresh stream, where you would be near a forest or firewood, where you could actually put seeds into the ground to grow crops and feed yourself, other than this artificial environment smothered in tarmac and concrete. In the developed world today, we no longer fear famine or starvation or the coming of winter. We've been able to apply our scientific understanding to preserve food. We invented the canning process and we also worked out a way to make little boxes of artificial winter. That's all a refrigerator or freezer is. And it's that key development that has enabled us to build the modern world, to live in these hugely popular cities. One of the top items on your post-apocalyptic to-do list is going to be where can I find some food? How do I make sure I'm not going to starve to death? Although you'll be living out in rural areas, you're not going to have to work out farming and agriculture for yourself. 
as soon as the world has collapsed. You're going to want to travel into the cities every now and then to scavenge and forage what you need. They still represent fabulously concentrated dollops of resources. Now, clearly, you'd want to eat all the fruit and vegetables first. Those, those all gone off in the first couple of days or weeks. And then you'd move on to eating all the dried rice and pasta, things that will preserve for several years. And then last of all, you want to save yourself for the canned food. Those tins of food will remain good to eat for decades. How long do you think you could survive for before you'd either eaten all of the food that was there or it gone off before you could get round to eating it? Well, to work this out, I went to an average supermarket, walked up and down every aisle with pen and paper, getting some very odd looks, and counted everything in that supermarket that was edible. Multiplied all of that together and then divided it by the amount you would need to eat per day to survive. And the answer comes out that a single supermarket could keep one person alive for 55 years or 63 years if you're happy to eat all the canned dog food and cat food as well. Let's talk about some post-apocalyptic life hacks. How can you use or repurpose everyday items to help you survive? How can you start a fire for heat or for cooking your food if it's a bit damp and windy? Everyday items like lip balm or Vaseline or hairspray. These are called accelerants. They're very flammable. You can use them to help start a fire. Even a tampon is a very useful piece of kit. All a tampon really is, is a wad of very fine cotton fibers. So if you rip it open, you've now got some ideal kindling for starting your fire. If it's sunny, you could use a pair of glasses to focus the sun's rays. If you've got a battery and some wire, or even just the metal foil around a stick of chewing gum, you could try short-circuiting that battery to create sparks to fall onto your kindling. Pretty soon after the apocalypse, water will just stop flowing out of the taps. You could dip a glass into a river, but that water's probably quite murky. So perhaps the first thing you want to do would be to filter that water through something as simple as a pair of stockings, or maybe a bucket where you put layers of charcoal and sand into it to filter out that particulate matter. But ultimately, you need to make sure you've killed any germs or bugs. So you need to know how you can purify water so that it doesn't kill you. And so when you're scavenging through the abandoned cities, deserted buildings and houses. All you would need to do would be to find something as simple as an empty plastic bottle like this. You can use a technique called SODIS or solar disinfection. And all you do is put your suspect water into an empty plastic bottle and then just leave it out in the sunshine. The ultraviolet rays can pass straight through that water and kill or inactivate any bacteria and bugs that are in there. You can come back to your water a day or two later, put it to your lips, and know for a fact, because of science, that it's safe and clean to drink. Sooner or later, while our post-apocalyptic society is recovering, we'll no longer be able to scavenge or forage for what we need. By that point, we're going to have to have learnt how to make and do things from scratch. Just think for a second of all the things we take for granted without thinking about. How could you start recovering some of those key technologies for yourself? The fact is, and even something as simple as a pencil, this simplest implement that we ever use there's not a single person on the planet that knows how to make one of these. 
the eraser is made using rubber that's come from a rubber plantation in Malaysia. The graphite, the lead, might have been mined or quarried in Brazil. And even the wooden sheath, that just comes from chopping down a tree, right? But to chop down a tree, you need an axe. To make an axe, you need steel. To make steel, you need to mine iron ore, and then how to process and smelt that iron ore, and then how to forge a tool using that metal. There is a huge iceberg of collective knowledge underlying the surface of this simple tool. As a civilization, we have an immense collective capability. But as individuals, we're ignorant and incapable. One part of this vast, invisible, behind-the-scenes infrastructure but that we rely upon every day of our lives, but don't even realize it's there, is the Global Communications Network. If you pick up your phone and send a text message to a friend in China, you might think the message just bounces off a satellite and received again. But it's so much more complicated than that. The signal from your phone is sent out as radio waves, which are picked up by your local cell tower. That's then passed electronically through wires to a control center, where it's converted into light. And that is then sent down fiber optic cable beneath the ocean, thousands of miles that's so received at the coast of China, and that process is reversed. The light is converted into electricity, which is beamed out as radio waves for your friend's phone to receive it and your words to appear on her screen. All of that is happening every day, millions of times over, invisible and unnoticed. What we're really talking about is how can you take all of this, the sum total of human knowledge, it's taken us centuries to build up and condense it to its very essence, the very core knowledge that you would need to unpack and rebuild everything from there. We're going to have to reinvent and relearn how the world around us works. The most crucial invention for this has been the scientific method. Now, it, it might sound surprising, but the way that we do science is itself an invention. Science isn't a collection of facts and figures. It's the way that you can figure things out for yourself. In order to, to do science, to understand the world around us, you need to be able to observe it in different ways. And before you can build the lens for the microscope or the telescope or a test tube or a thermometer or a barometer, the things we use to understand the world around us, you need to make glass. Glass is the critical substance that is relatively strong, chemically inert, it doesn't change things you put into it, but it's also perfectly transparent. Now, it turns out the recipe for glass only uses three ingredients. You need silica, you can get from sand. You need soda ash, you can get from seaweed or other plants living by the coast. And you need lime, which you can get from seashells or coral or limestone or chalk. You can make for yourself glass from the raw materials found on a single beach. And I've done this. I've done this ultimate Robinson Crusoe experiment, making glass from scratch for myself on a single beach in a day. While an actual apocalypse is hopefully very unlikely, I still think this thought experiment of how you go right back to scratch and make and do things for yourself is hugely informative. But even if the apocalypse never comes, an appreciation of how things work and where they come from will enrich our lives. It was science that built our modern world and it's science you would need to reboot civilization once again.